right? If you understand how finance works, you'll understand how money works. When you understand how money works, you'll understand how you should and shouldn't structure things, how you should spend your money, how you shouldn't. Focus on the 20% of things that are producing 80% of the income. Like if you've got 30 cows and only six of those cows are actually giving you a thousand liters of milk, don't spread your energy onto the other 26 or 24. Yep. That's giving you one liter each. Yes. Right? Because if you only remain in your tiny little bubble, your world re- will remain so small that you would probably never experience any growth. But the point is to know these things, to get the information you need and to take action. You cannot grow if you do not take action. Right? That was the number one most valuable lesson for me. Decide what it is you want. How do you want it? Right? What does that picture look like for you? And just do it. Right, guys, welcome to the It's More Than Just Money podcast. My name is Witness Mtaka. I'm your host. And today I'm sitting with a financial wizard. That's what I'm going to call him. Okay. Uh, his name is Bruce Lee. Don't expect a Jackie Chan looking man. Uh, but he's a very knowledgeable person when it comes to finance and property. And I'm going to have a conversation with him because he's one of the finalists of the Investor of the Year Award um, presented by Sapin. And I'm hoping to take as much knowledge out of him as possible. So if you want me to do that, by the way, uh, click on that subscribe button, click on the notifications bell, comment, let us know which part of this conversation actually resonates with you. He's going to be sharing a lot of gems. In fact, he had already started. Hmm. Bruce, you went right into it, eh? I did. You and I actually told to keep quiet. That's right. For a right. bit. Yes, yes. Yeah. I am very passionate about things that uh, interest me. and. I'm also really passionate about money and property, finance, money and property. So. Sure, sure. So, but tell me a bit about your, your background and, and the motivation towards um, building that kind of background for yourself, like where you come from, uh, how you got into finance and leading up to property as well. Okay. So, wow. Even um, during school already, I really, really enjoyed doing accounting stuff. And um, I mean, each person has their own sort of strength and things that interest them. But accounting just interested me right from the very beginning. My grandfather used to have his own business. We used to count out wages, you know, write up all things like that. So um, I think that accounting always interested me from school time already. So I had already decided that that was definitely what I wanted to get into. Finance, you're accounting. Finance, yes, exactly. Okay. So that's pretty much what I did out of school. Um, I started studying towards my degree. Um, I got a job, obviously. And my job was straight out finance from the very beginning already. So I had a lot of interesting stops along the way with that finance job. So I pretty much progressed through all of the steps until I became the financial manager of a very niche market, pigments and dispersions. Uh, their branch in South Africa. I call was pigment? Pigments and dispersion. So it's like the people that make the colorant for paint. Oh, and okay. not just paint. Okay. But that, that was just the people who bleach their skin and stuff. Well, um, <laughs> who <make> so, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think that the interesting thing for me was I was really passionate about the manufacturing organizations because systems, processes, like all of these machines, uh, you know, all of these parts that really, really interests me, right? So, um, yeah, so I was doing that and we went through a system change in terms of accounting software and that really, really piqued my interest. So from there, I moved along to the IT industry. Wait, what do you mean system change? Well, what exactly? Uh, like ERP. So we, we, we had an accounting package only, which means like we were just focusing on the debits and the credits, you know, of everything and everything else was done manually. We had Excel spreadsheets for work orders and Excel spreadsheets for deliveries and things like that. It was hectic. So we moved over into a fully fledged ERP system. 
So ERP system basically manages from beginning to end. For those who um, don't know, what, what is an ERP Enterprise system? resource planning. But it's, it's so much more than that because it will, it, it will literally take care of um, your, like from work orders uh, or not. So if I had to say, um, it would basically go from inception of your contact with your customer. So it will start off with, the customer order that will obviously turn into a work order because something has to be made to deliver to them. Deliveries will be done. Invoicing will be done. All of your accounting will be on record there. All of your manufacturing work will be on record there. So like full house, um, taking care of an entire business, end-to-end -end business management system. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I moved on uh, to that. And because of that change, I had to find something to supplement both my income and my retirement. Why, did you take a lower package or? I did. And I also had nice perks where I was working. Uh, so being the financial manager of a South African branch, uh, that was, that was a really cushy job. Yeah. Am I allowed so to say that was a cushy well. job? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, I had to look for something to, to take care of those things, right? Because I understand that these are necessities, right? You have to make sure that you are sufficiently taken care of when you are no longer going to be working. Retirement, however that looks for you. But you made this career change during COVID. So that was in 2019. I made this career change in June of 2019. So right before, before COVID, because COVID started maybe like December. And 2020. Uh, so March of 2020, we had COVID. So right? you wouldn't have known fully. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, but the, the company that I worked for at that specific time, that IT, uh, I'm calling them an IT company, but it's really a business management company. Uh, a really fantastic, right? Fantastic. I absolutely enjoyed working for them. Uh, the lady that I worked for, the CEO, is a phenomenal uh, woman. Anyway, so I made this transition, and at that point, I had to do something to supplement my um, income as well as something for when I retire. So I started investigating properties, and I came across a company, and I'm not going to name drop. Yeah. Uh, so they they offer you a package service of We'll teach you, uh, we'll set up your trust and everything. And we even develop properties so you can buy them from us. So I thought, oh, it's okay, it's cool. I'll go and have a look. I checked this out. Um, and then... Sounds like they were promising you growth. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> See so, what I did there. <laughs> yes. So I decided to do a little bit of investigation because being someone in finance, I understood the spreadsheets that they had sent through. Mm -hmm. And... Oh, one and one is two, right? It didn't make sense. And when it's not two, there's a problem. Yeah. So I thought, no, no, this requires some investigation. So I started checking out, uh, you know, groups that were available around and I came across Zappen. Am I allowed to name drop Zappen now? Okay. Yeah. So I came across Zappen and I asked some questions on the social media platforms that they had. And I got a fantastic answer from a guy at that point, who I obviously didn't know, uh, Rian Nordia. Um, yeah. And so, Rian, yeah. Yes. So Rian Nordia answered my question on there. And I thought, what this guy says makes sense. So I started spending a lot of time um, getting educated on property. That's the word that I can use. So I spent time finding out things. I attended um, events, seminars. I subscribed to courses and I learned stuff. And then had my workshop with Andrew Walker uh, because I then did some course learnings with uh, with Sappen, I had my one day workshop. Was it, it was a one day workshop at that point of time with Andrew Walker, and it absolutely blew my mind. I I could not believe that I wanted to supplement my income. I was happy to pay in money every single month because, like, it's it's a provident fund saving, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I taken up this property, I was happy to pay in money every single month. So I was going to buy this property pay in the shortfall, and then in 20 odd years when I retire, I'm going to be making so money. So you're not a cash flow off, investor. Isn't it? I knew nothing about it, right? Yeah. Up until that point where I'd started asking those that questions. That other company that, did not teach you? No, I mean, they were the company that we were going to pay in the money on, the deals, right? Yeah. Every month, the, yeah. the shortfall. The shortfall. So, um, and that was an absolute revelation. And I was like, hold on a second. Are you actually telling me that I can make surplus money out of this property every single month. And from there, for me, it was just like, 
a light bulb went on and I understood that there was a bigger picture to what was happening here. Right. Mm-hmm. So did my learnings and everything. Uh, we went into COVID a month after I attended my one day workshop and then everything was obviously at a standstill. But from that point, I was still determined to find properties, um, whatever that took. So connections with agents, you know, throughout the time of COVID, people were still listing houses. And I mean, you could still look at them. We had virtual tours of them. Mm -hmm. So I ended up purchasing a property, a nice distressed uh, townhouse. Um, The the owner was distressed financially. The property was also distressed uh, quite severely. Um, But it was, uh, I saw the opportunity and then it was fantastic. I renovated it. It was so beautiful. I got so much interest during the renovation process from people in the complex having visitors over that everybody just wanted to rent it. So I ended up renting it out for a very short period of time. And then I learned a lot of lessons during that period of time, right? Everything that you can think of. Oh, well, from tenant management to utilities to building compliance issues, you can't believe that complexes can have building compliance issues. Yeah, right? what were the issues there? Because I wanted to ask um, mm. about the challenges that you experienced when you made the career change, yeah. as well as when you did that specific property now that you mention it. So I think let's start off with the property because those challenges are easier to answer than my career change um, challenges. So the property challenges, what I faced there was you'd expect a sectional title to be above board in terms of building plans, um, money matters, all those sort of things, because someone is supposed to take care of those. Those are rules, right? And it ended up not being so. So there were some extensions that were added onto the property. Uh, So there were some drain issues. That's the right word. So there was literally a gully in the middle of the well, in the middle of the kitchen, in the kitchen cupboard. When you open the kitchen cupboard, the gully was right there. It was open. Um, so, I mean, things like that. A toilet's not being ventilated because they'd been built closed and there was no external ventilation. So you have to learn about all of these rules and stuff that has to happen. And thank goodness for Marissa, right? Yeah. Because she was my inspector from the beginning. So I knew about these things and I knew about most of these things. And I knew that there was going to be corrective action for these things. And she helped out with those things, told me this is how you're going to solve the gully problems at the end of the world, et cetera. So, yeah. For those who don't know, Maricia Robus, she's a property inspector. Yes. We're actually having her as, as a speaker that's more than just money business and sem- business and property seminar. But yeah, yeah. continue. So, um, yeah, so all of those challenges had to be resolved. Pe- they'd done weird things like knock out walls of bathrooms and the bathrooms were just open into the bedrooms. Or, so anyway. Those issues had to be dealt with. And then, of course, the tenant management, right? So um, I had to go through. So utility management was quite simple, right? I didn't have an issue with that. I understand systems. So I got uh, prepaid electricity and water metering in, and that was taken care of. But tenant management, invoicing, leasing, really not an issue. But uh, getting people to pay, that's something you have no control over. So it was very unfortunate that I also ended up doing an eviction uh, on this property. With the um, first tenant? Yes. Oh, did so, you take the first guy that walked through the door? No, 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 <laughs> I didn't do that. So that was very, very unfortunate. But like I'm saying, this property taught me a lot of lessons. Um, and I suppose you'll never make the same mistake twice. If you do, right. that's not really smart. Right. So, yeah, so went through that eviction um, and then... I actually did recover my money. I made use of, it seems like I'm just name dropping today. I made use of Expello. Um, I don't know if you know Elise from Expello. Mm -mm. Anyway, so they took care of the entire eviction for me, the recoveries and all of that. So I was fortunate to recover my money. It's something I never want to go through again. It's not, uh, although we invest to make money, there's still an emotional aspect involved in that right? Knowing that you have to evict somebody, right? It's for the greater good of your bank account, but you, because you obviously can't pay for someone to live in your property, but emotionally yeah. that's tough, right? Yeah. Uh, irrespective of what the situation is. So uh, yeah, it's something that I wouldn't like to go through again, but yes, I had to do an eviction as well. And then after that, I had a lovely lady staying there, but then I decided, you know what, this was meant to be a flip from the beginning. And because it was so nice and people liked it, I liked it. I wanted to keep it, but I decided. You was know this the property that was funded 100% yes. by, by the bank? Yes, that's right. Right. Yep. Okay. 
So um, after my renovations, we refinanced out the renovation cost as well. So I literally had no money in the deal at that point in time anymore. But I decided that it was supposed to be a flip. I didn't want to hold on to the buy to let. I knew that wasn't the model that I wanted to use going forward. So I just uh, got rid of it. Hmm. So yeah. looking at that first property deal mm-hmm. as an experience, what would you draw from that to share with somebody who's looking to do it for the first time as well? I would definitely say that when you're purchasing a first-time property, it would be better to go with something smaller to cut your teeth, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we all have these ideas of grandeur, like we want to have big deals. They have to be fantastic deals. These are the things that we hear of, and that's what excites us. But I'm glad that my first deal was a smaller property. It does come with its own um, with its own challenges, like having a body corporate. Uh, I mean, you have to know things about sectional titles then to understand what you're buying into, to make sure that they're not defunct. So I would definitely say, if that is something that you're going to do, stand alone would be better as first time if you could. But if that's not what you can buy as your first property, I would say, make sure that you get hold of somebody that can at least help you know um, the things that you don't know, right? So uh, get your body corporate financials and see if they're in a good financial position. Before buying. Exactly, before yeah. buying already. These are things that people don't think about. Get the rules. Are the rules actually registered? Are you going to have any issues? What do you want to do with that property afterwards? Do you want to rent it out? How do you want to rent it out? Are there challenges with how you want to rent it out? If you wanted to buy it, to put it on Airbnb, does the complex allow that? Doesn't it allow that? So. Make sure about all of your rules. And I think that uh, probably the most important is uh, not to make emotional decisions on your property. Like when you find it, run the numbers Mm -hmm. and make sure that those numbers satisfy your metrics, not other people's metrics. Like if you come to me and say, uh, Bruce, I want to invest in property. And then I say, sure, what is it that you want out of this? And you're saying, I want to have a 15% 15% return. But I'm saying to you, but why? Because you can actually have a 20% return. Or, you know, at 15% is a bit much. Maybe you should go for 10%. Don't do that. Like settle for whatever your metrics is because that is where you are comfortable operating. Mm-hmm. And then what then, are there any strategies or things that one can do to actually be able to get 100% financing as well? So when banks look at financing, they do look at what your credit rating is. So your credit rating, that also includes things like your credit appetite um, and also just how you've spent your money, what debt you have, things like that. So I think that the banks are comfortable when they see that your appetite is not a lot. They don't, banks don't like people that have got a high appetite for credit. So if you're just applying left and right for credit, they don't, they don't really like that. But if you are able to manage your debt and there are rules about Uh, well, I say rules, there are guidelines about how they perceive your debts, right? So credit card debt over 50% of your limit is perceived as a very bad thing. So you get rated down for that. Obviously defaults, not paying on time, all of all those sorts of things. And then the only other thing that I could say about that is have a relationship with your bank. I have a relationship with my bank. I've banked with them for a very, very long time. And they have in fact funded all of my properties after that first property, all of them 100%. Uh, and they are my favorite bank, but we're not going to mention their name. Yeah, here tell them today. to pay me the next time you come. I'll I should, them. right? <laughs> yes, exactly. So, and, I, and that's what it was for me. Like, I, I serviced my debt when they gave me bonds. Um, you know, I, I kept up my end of the bargain. And I think that makes them happy and comfortable to continue that relationship with you. I've never had them turn down a bond application. Nice. But it also speaks to your ability to take care of finances. I mean, you are a financial manager by training uh, in any case, right? Um, But your category for the Investor of the Year Award is most growth, right? What strategies have you implemented to achieve consistent growth in your property investment portfolio year after year? So, after my buy to let... I, I still continued to attend different um, seminars, uh, different events, 
And I continue to broaden my knowledge on things. Like I watch a lot of educational, um, educational videos on whatever the channel might be, whatever social media channels. And besides for that, I also got a, um, a business coach, not just a property coach, I have a business coach. And I think that people understate the value of having things like this. I think in all, in all walks of life, I wish that I had thought about getting a business or career coach earlier on in my career, right? That might've been mm. different. So that for me was a game changer because I think they're skilled in bringing out the best in you because I, I think that they can see what that is, what you're good at, what you might not be good at. Um, and I think that they offer you guidelines, supports, those kinds of things. So um, that definitely helped me remain consistent because I had an accountability partner. The groups helped me remain consistent because we chatted about progress, what sort of strategies, what can you do to amplify your strategy? Where are you stuck? What do you need help with? Right. Mm -hmm. But I think that the biggest thing of all is you have to know what your weaknesses are in yep. your personality and you have to overcome those. So by, by nature, I am a procrastinator because I take a long time to make decisions because I need a lot of information um, and things have to satisfy the criteria that I've put out there. Safety and net. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. So I'm quite risk averse. But the point is to know these things, to get the information you need and to take action. You cannot grow if you do not take action. Right. That was the number one most valuable lesson for me. Decide what it is you want. How do you want it? Right. What does that picture look like for you? And just do it. Mm. So find the property, make the phone call. That property is not going to be added to your portfolio by staying on your wish list, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So how do you decide then um, when you've decided, right, to take mm. action? How do you decide which properties um, are going to be for flips or which okay. properties are you going to hold on to do some buy to let? Or is okay. it more of we're doing buy to let temporarily until we let go of it? Or, or what's the strategy then? So... Very early on in um, property learnings, we learned that you have two main strategies in property. And one of those is a cash flow strategy. So that's making money out of your property. And mm -hmm. the other one is the cash strategy. So that's making bulk amounts of cash. So flips are really nice for making bulk amounts of cash. And obviously cash flow properties are nice for making steady income money. So I think that when you're actually looking at this and getting into property, it's important for you to decide what sort of strategy works for you. Are you the type of person that is going to enjoy um, looking after tenants? If not, don't use the cash flow strategy, right? Do you have people skills to look after those tenants? Are you okay with systems to manage different things? If not, don't do it. Just get properties for flips and make your money doing that. Yeah. Do you have instances where a deal didn't go as planned oh, and, and how did you do. manage that and what did you learn from it? My very second property that I wanted to acquire uh, was a multi-let property uh, in, a, in a very, very nice suburb. And I was willing to pay top dollar for that property, in fact, because I already saw the kind of money that it could make. So I entered into the deal and uh, I got Marissa to do my inspection. Marissa has inspected every single property I've bought without fail because I trust her. So she did the inspection for me and I requested building plans and um, I'd waited quite some time. So we'd started moving this along already. And fortunately, I made use of my attorney to do the, the bond um, transfer. I had to make use of their attorney for their transfer, but I had some leverage in this deal, right? And um, I just kept on saying, listen, we're not proceeding until we have the building plans. Like this is, these are my requirements. And the agent kept on saying, no, man, it's okay. You can go. They'll reserve some money aside if there's anything wrong with the building plan so that we can have them drafted or whatever. Yeah. And I was adamant that I was not going to do that. And uh, it turned out that we eventually got the building plans and some of the buildings that they had built, in fact, a very large portion was encroaching on the boundary in the first place. Even the roof was over, was not compliant with building regulation. Uh, which was already pointed out to me in the inspection report. So that's why I did not proceed with that. But I'd already paid transfer duty to SARS because we'd already got into this whole transfer process. So um, I 
eventually ended up going the legal route to have the sale cancelled. And I waited a full year to get my transfer duty back from SARS. Jeez. Yep. Sure. So yep. what did you learn from that? Is there a way you could have avoided any of that? Uh, well, I could, I suppose, have um, said that I wanted the building plans up front. And I wasn't going to entertain anything else. But fortunately, because my clauses had stipulated that I had to have approved building plans. So I didn't just say I want the building plans. I said, I want to have the approved building plans for right. this. This was part of my system. The way that approved is very exactly. important. There Otherwise, they'll give me the building plans not approved and I'll just have to accept that. So, um, yeah, I think make very, very sure of your purchasing clauses. Okay. Yeah. So have you... If there was to be another pandemic, right? Yes. Have you decided what sort of strategies you would apply uh, for you to offset the challenges posed by, by a pandemic? So after my buy-to-let property, the, the flip that I held onto for a little while, yeah. I attended a workshop and I sat next to a mining engineer. And she's so much more than a mining engineer, right? A, a fantastic lady, in fact. Uh, at we were attending a student accommodation uh, session and she'd say to me that I've just started my student accommodation. I'm having it uh, renovated as we speak. And uh, she chatted to me a little bit about it. And I thought, this is the kind of deals that I want to be involved in. Not just for the student accommodation, but because of the multi-led strategy, right? Yeah. I think that helps a little bit when you have challenges like, people that aren't paying their rent or, um, or that have different sorts of challenges, you know, because you're not losing a full property's income, you're losing a portion of it. So I think that for me, if we did have to have another pandemic again, I am very adaptable, right, to change. So when things happen, I'll easily be able to pivot, look at what other options we can explore for that. So I do have a student housing right now, Going into a pandemic, I'm sure that we wouldn't have uh, students attending university again like we did the last time. Mm -hmm. But digital nomads, you know, all different types of people have different requirements for accommodation. So I would definitely just pivot to a different strategy to uh, maintain occupancy on the properties. Mm. Occupancy is the most important yep. thing. So what is the most valuable um, lesson that you've learned from flipping properties? I mean, with every business that you get into, right? There is an essential lesson that you, you grasp from what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, no matter how boring it is. I mean, you yes. said property can be mundane. That's right. Uh, uh, and boring, yes. uh, depending on the kind of deals yes. you're doing. That's right. Uh, but I'm sure there's been some lessons and how they've shaped your investment approach. Mm. Well, what are those lessons? Flipping properties, budget control is super important. Like budgets easy for can you, right? creep away. Easy yes, for you, yes. a financial guy, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> budgets can creep away from you really, really quickly. So it's important to keep your finger on top of that. And uh, costing. Costing is the easiest way to make sure that your budgets stay on track. So don't just go into a deal thinking, this reno is going to cost me 200,000 rand because you suck that out of your thumb. Write it down, even if it is rough, right? Mm. Write it down maintain your um, budget. And then contractor um, management is super, super important when you're Contractor management. Flips. Contractor management. That's what I'm calling it. Contractor yeah. management, yeah. right? So they need to be managed to those right, guys. <laughs> right, they do. So at the point of my first flip, I still had a full-time job. So I had to juggle between the two. And obviously, you already heard that I was new in that industry that I was working in as well. So yeah. that was challenging. I did have a lot of support. Too many so, new things at the same right. time. For a guy who procrastinates. Right. Yes. That so sounds, I know sounds my like weaknesses. You went out I know how to take action. With that one. Definitely. Yes. But I mean, that's, that's where growth lies, isn't it? Yes. It's exactly that. So strangely enough, I have a passion for non-local properties so non-local uh, yes non-local okay. so i non-local is an international or no, non-local is not, not Cape Town, Durban. not johannesburg uh, so okay. um i do i do have student housing in johannesburg and the trend that i'm seeing there is that we unfortunately have a lot of slum lords right students live in some terrible conditions the properties that i've seen are slum absolutely lords, disastrous check lords. I don't, I cannot even, I don't, the things I've seen are bad. They're bad. So, um, yeah, that's one of the trends that I see. People try to make 
so much money out of their property that they forget they're dealing with people, right? Yeah. That's like, those are still people. So that's, and then um, coastal, which is what I really, really like. So that's, uh, that's my, that's my growth focus moving forward. Um, I see good opportunity there. Mm. We've seen a dip in market prices over the past two years, uh, mostly because of the pandemic as well, being coastal properties. And those properties are starting to make an upturn now. So great opportunities available there if you've planned and are ready to take advantage of those. So how do you think then these trends are going to evolve over the next couple of years? And how do you plan to take advantage of that first off? I definitely think, positioning. Yep. You know? So I definitely think that a lot of um, these properties, like I said, have taken a knock in their pricing because of the pandemic. Um, mm. Also because of other challenges, like if we look at KZN, for instance, they had all of those floods. They were really hot hit. So property prices really took a beating. We had some migration. You know, everybody's moved to Cape Town, right? Yeah. So um, Everybody we, except me and you, right? Right. But we're coming, guys. Yes, <laughs> yes, we're coming. So, um, so that also left a lot of properties vulnerable in both Johannesburg and in the KZN area. And when you look at property statistics, these areas have suffered a drop in their prices. So good to take advantage of that now that they're starting to see an upswing again. People are traveling, people are optimistic again. Uh, so those properties have steadily started to increase in price again. Mm -hmm. So taking advantage of that, I mean, if you are ready to invest in those properties, look at them, schedule those viewings, make negotiations while those people are still willing to sell their properties, right? Yeah. And get your foot in the door. So although you said property investing is mundane and boring, and yes. I think it gets mundane and boring when you know what you're doing. Yeah, uh, because it becomes a, rep a repetitive system yes. that you've put in place for yourself. That's right, right. But for a guy that's just starting out, there are a lot of complexities. Yes, uh, that they can come across. Yeah. So, what advice do you have for new guys that are starting out, uh, for them to be able to overcome those complex challenges that come with investing in property? I think that those challenges are also really dependent on your personality type, right? So for me, one of those challenges is making contact with those agents. It's really not something that I enjoy, but you have to build the relationships. Mm. And for somebody that is maybe outgoing, a challenge that they might have is actually knowing whether this deal that they're talking about is feasible. So what do those numbers look like? So I think that they need to assess where they think their shortcomings are. And the problem as well is that you don't know what you don't know, right? That's the thing. And yeah. um, so I would definitely say some form of education, right? So whether that is, like I've said, watching a YouTube video, even though I attend professional property events, I do also watch YouTube people. Like there are a lot of influencers out there that know good things. Yeah. So at least some sort of education will help you know what it is you need to know to mm. make a move on your first deal. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any tips on how to identify potential growth opportunities in the market? Okay. More specifically, the property market. Mm. I think that when you look at places where a lot of attention is focused, so when you hear hype about something, it's definitely worth taking a look at, right? Because there's a reason why that hype is there. So saturation is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm. It depends on how you compete with that saturation, right? I mean, we have, we have many finance professionals. We have many IT professionals out there. So what makes that different? Yes. How you perform is what makes that different. So I think where you see a lot of talk and a lot of interest, investigate those areas because that is probably a very safe bet to make your first um, move as well. Yeah. Yep. When you made that career change in 2019, right? You yep. obviously then started to build um, two careers simultaneously because you had the new career that yes. you started. Then you had the property career that you had started. I mean, how do you continue to grow in those careers? And personally, as a person. So it's more like professional plus personal growth. I mean, what, are, what do you do okay. to grow in, in both aspects? A lot of sacrifice. 
That's what are you sacrificing? <laughs> hey, there are black people time. watching here. They'll be thinking, hey, <laughs> sacrifice. <laughs> a lot of time, a lot of hours. Um, I think, like I've mentioned, I have a, a business coach, so um, a monetary sacrifice as well, right? To, to bring you up to speed on things, right? So um, I think growing my professional career in a different industry really took a lot of effort. Uh, so I'm a finance guy. I yes, understand I, I understand one and one. Yeah. Um, and I think moving into the IT space, understanding things like coding, um, systems, database languages, right? That was, that was complex stuff. That, that took a lot of time and it took a lot of energy. But then on the other end, I was really passionate about property and I really wanted to do that. So I spent a lot of evenings attending um, webinars, events, um, doing learnings, courses and stuff that I'd enrolled in. And I think that um, personally, you have to grow as well. Otherwise, those two things would never have worked out. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time on personal development uh, with my business coach uh, by reading various different books and just by, just by learning more about yourself. Yeah. yeah. So in all the, the growth that you did through books, courses, mentorships, coaching, mm -hmm. right? What are the resources that have had the most impact um, for you personally and professionally? I definitely think that books, books and, uh, and, and YouTube videos, right? I yeah. definitely think were the two main things. Um, because when I read self-development books, it was almost as if though I was immersed in the book. Like I, I was, I, I literally felt like I was attending the story as I was watching it unfold, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that was really nice. So uh, the personal development books that I read at that point of time were not about how to adult or stuff like that. Those were things that were specific to my personality type, things like how to have good habits, um, because by my very nature, I'm, I'm a structured person. So how to develop good habits and strategies that really helped me because that amplified skills that were already um were already with me yeah. yeah so i met someone at the gym today right okay and the guy um is a professional fighter okay and he says to me witness focus on the 20 percent of things that are producing 80 percent of the income like if you've got 30 cows and only six of those cows are actually giving you a thousand liters of milk. Don't spread your energy onto the other mm -hmm. 26 or 24. Yep. That's giving you one liter each. Yes. Right. And, and, and for you, what are your thoughts around that? Because you've been in business, you've worked in, as, a, as a financial manager, you've seen how yeah. companies perform. Yes. Uh, well, how, what, how, does that statement resonate with you? And if so, in what way? I have two different views on that, really. So, Yes, you should focus on the 20% that gives you 80%. But when you are starting out with something, it's important to remember <sighs> that that 80% requires attention so that you can get that 20% that gives you that 80%. If I had just at that point starting out my fresh career deciding that property is it and I was only going to focus on property, I was going to lose a job that was paying me a very good salary that I used to leverage, right? to get me properties uh, because I had to sign surety for that, right? And I used my salary for that because those properties at that point could not speak for themselves. There was no financial record or anything like that. So yes, it's important to focus on what gives you the results, but it's also important to focus on what will give you the potential growth and return at the end. So those cows that are giving you a thousand liters of milk only could end up being your best producers, right? Maybe they just needed a little bit of attention which is what property was for me mm -hmm. at that point in time. So that's my one view on it. It was a cash cow. Yes. <laughs> my, especially my first deal was very, very lucrative. Yeah. And my second point on that is don't waste your time doing something that you are not passionate about, number one. And number two, that you know is not going to give you any results. When mm. the horse is dead, get off, right? Yeah. So if you knew that those cows were not going to produce that milk, then don't spend your time on it. So. I love that. You have an intelligent way of answering questions. Thank you. <laughs> I like that. So, it's so amazing. So what are your goals for the next five years? I mean, be it property or finance. So shortly after resigning from my full-time job 
last year, right? Uh, because of my interest in property and my portfolio had allowed me to do that. I'd uh, pushed for significant growth within that year and the money I was making allowed me to comfortably be without the, um, the stick of my, of my full-time job, right? But shortly after resigning from that job, I mentioned that property can be a little bit boring, you know, when you're, when you're getting into things and you're just managing them and it's just continuing. So yeah. I uh, started my own business, right? So I'm still very much property focused. The business is not my main focus, but it's something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, once again, still accounting and still systems because that's my thing. Yeah. Um, so where I see my growth for the next five years is I'd really like to focus on building that business because it's something that I'm passionate about. But I also have a very specific focus for my property portfolio that I would like to grow within these next five years. And I'm planning some very interesting things. I hope I'm going to be able to pull them off. So not having that uh, fantastic pay slip to put down as collateral, right, uh, is a little bit challenging when you're a property investor. Mm. And then something else that I did become extremely passionate about this year is I attended a Robert Kiyosaki event from Success Resources. And I was on stage speaking about Airbnb and um, student accommodation. You were speaking. Right. Yes. I, yeah. I did have a speaking slot there. And a lot of people came up afterwards and well, said... With, uh, Robin Booth and them. Uh, so I attended Johannesburg. So Robin Booth and them did Cape Town. Cape so Town. I was okay. here in Johannesburg with Andrew. Yeah. Right? So a lot of people came afterwards and they said, we were expecting so much more about property at this Robert Kiyosaki event. Because, I mean, that's, that's usually the number one thing that people take away from Robert Kiyosaki, right? Is property. Mm. And they said... Where were all of the property educators? And I realized that there's a very definite need for people to become educated, upskilled, assisted, or whatever that case may be. Mm. So in the coming five years, I'm looking forward to participating in um, some very interesting things that we have coming up. So I'm also going to be co-creating a course on student accommodation. So I'm looking forward to that. I do support a lot of Airbnb hosts on local groups and I'm looking forward to sharing more, right? And, uh, and reaching more people that can learn the things that I learned about property. Uh, yeah. Like I mentioned to you, I thought property was going to be a cash flow negative thing I was going to pay in every month and I was, I was surprised. I you, learned you a lot. Had, you had the wrong teacher, my man. Right? A yeah. lot of people. Thank, thank God you, you learned how to pivot and find yes, the right teachers, exactly. right? And now I'd like other people to find the right teachers. Yes, so that's something yes, that I'm also yes. going to be putting a lot of focus on in the next five years. Okay. And then are there new, any new strategies or areas in property that you want to tap into? So I have already done uh, buy-to-lets, flips, uh, Airbnb and student accommodation. I'm actually really liking the student accommodation module, uh, model, <laughs> model. Yeah. and I'm, um, I'm already looking at acquiring additional properties. But what I'd really like to look at now is purpose-built monsters. That's what I'm going to call them. Purpose-built purpose built monsters. monsters. Okay. Like full-blown blocks for student accommodation. I, I really do like the model. The systems and processes to manage that are just natural for me. So that is, that is an avenue that I'm definitely going to be exploring as one of my next additions to my portfolio. Yeah. A massive high-rise purpose-built student accommodation building. Yeah. I mean, Steve Jobs talks about um, connecting the dots yep. and going back, right? For you, when you look back at the journey of your life, what do you think the dots have been that have actually brought you to where you are? You know, I was listening to one guy. Uh, he lost his foot, right? He's an actor. Okay. And, and he says, he realizes now at his age older, He's built podcasts, he's, he's built a business, mm. he's still an actor, but it's only because there are certain things he did when he was a kid that he didn't even understand. Yeah. When he did tennis yes. as a black kid, okay. and only later to find out that a script would require somebody who knows how to play tennis. Okay. And he's like, oh, wow, maybe perhaps that's the reason why I had to play tennis as a kid, yeah. even though I didn't like it, right? So for you, what do you think the dots have been, that have been connected uh, maybe through your finance journey all the way into your property journey? 
It's actually really interesting that you ask this question because it's something that I think about quite often because I do think that things that you're exposed to shape your future quite a lot. Um, and like I mentioned, ever since I was at school, I enjoyed the actual accounting journey. So for me, um, dealing with finances is just something that's really natural. And I think that that is an amazing, um, an amazing advantage, right? If you understand how finance works, you'll understand how money works. When you understand how money works, you'll understand how you should and shouldn't structure things, how you should spend your money, how you shouldn't. But besides for that, a lot of things that I've been involved in throughout my career and my upbringing are really focused around processes on how things get done. And I'm very much a methodical, process-driven person. I uh, used to have a job with the Woolworths Group where I actually worked as a process manager. And what a process manager mm -hmm. is, is they are a branch financial manager as well as an operations manager. And I mean, you can imagine that exposure. Like we had SOPs, rules that had to be followed, all those kinds of things. And I often think that all of these things have culminated together to actually support the person that I've become. So mm -hmm. um, business operations is something that is just, normal for me. Finance is something that's just normal for me. And I think it's all of these things that I've been through that have actually added value to who I am as a person. Amazing. Hmm. So if you were to be given an opportunity to speak to the younger Bruce Lee, yes. what would you say to him? And this too is actually very strange because I recently employed an assistant uh, to work for me and she's quite young. And we speak a lot about about things that I would have liked someone to speak to me about when I was young. Wow. So I've had some really fantastic um, managers, right? When I started off my career, my very second job that I had, I worked for a fantastic treasury manager, uh, Mr. Kaiser Totsetsi at that time. And oh, he, was, okay. he was a phenomenal teacher, right? And he taught me a lot about um, also going out and getting what you wanted, right? He once made me compete for a job that I wanted. And I mean, this teaches you skills. So my assistant and I speak quite often about, about things, about, about growth and about, um, about all sorts of things about life, about, about business, about your career, right? Because a lot of people mm. don't do these things. And if I could speak to my younger self, I would say, don't be afraid to take advantage of opportunities, right? Up until I had this property exposure, I think that I was very afraid to make decisions um, that would put me out there, right? It's also why I didn't want to enter Investor of the Year because I didn't want to be put out there. But I understand that there's a bigger picture. And sometimes you just have to do things and not be afraid of doing them. And if I could turn back the clock 20 odd years, I would have become an entrepreneur from the very onset, from the time I left school. I don't think I would ever have started working but in hindsight, maybe I wouldn't have progressed and grown as I have. Maybe you wouldn't have been able to connect the dots. Exactly. Or maybe you'd have different dots yes. to connect. Hindsight has 2020 <laughs> vision, but that's not the way that it works. So what do you want? What are the key takeaways that you want our viewers um, and our audience to take from this conversation and from your journey? Something you want them to remember? I would say that when you don't expose yourself to things, right, you will never learn how many opportunities there are out there, mm. right? Because if you only remain in your tiny little bubble, your world will remain so small that you would probably never experience any growth. And I think that's what people need to understand. Learn things. Be be a student always. That's it. Mm. So that camera there is looking at you, right? Yes. And there's a kid, young kid, could be 18, could be 19, could be a guy in his 20s or a lady. Um, he's black, he's white, he's Indian, he's Chinese, okay. he's orange. Okay. And he's saying, I hear you. Um, but you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know how my life is right now. What would you say to him 
And what would be the thing that you would say from tomorrow they can start implementing to change their lives? So I think that a lot of people go through a lot of things in their lives, right? And nobody really knows what is written in somebody's book, right? You see me sitting here and you have a perception of what's in my book. But difficult things happen to a lot of people. Mm. And the number one thing for me is positivity and what you are saying to yourself on a daily basis really do have a serious impact on how you perceive things. So no matter how difficult your life is, I've also been in very difficult situations. No matter how difficult your life is, you have to maintain positivity and continue to search for a way to make things better, right? Let your ambition fuel you, if that's what it's going to take. Uh, let your why fuel you, if that's what it's going to take, if you have a specific reason. Your wife for, for your wife? Your, well, if your wife is going to fuel you, that. <laughs> but your why, more that specifically. Guy have a wife. He needs a wife. <laughs> well. Why um, before wife? Eh? Yeah. So um, I would definitely say that no matter how difficult you think things are, they could be a lot worse. So sure. No matter how difficult you think things are, they could be a lot worse. Yeah. That's an amazing quote. Yeah. So how can our audience connect with you or learn more about your work? So they can find me on social media. I am on social media. And um, other than that, yeah, I do. I have social media links. They can find me there. I'm sure that you'll be putting that up. Yeah, Bruce, um, you've got an incredible story. Thank you for sharing that story with, with us and for putting yourself out there. And most importantly, for contributing to the economy of South Africa because we need more people like you who are going to take risks, mm. who are going to quit their jobs and yeah. start businesses, <laughs> yeah. build portfolios, um, sit in platforms like these and not only just keep the knowledge to themselves, but be willing to empower others yeah. through what they've learned. I mean, you've paid a lot of money yes. for you to get the education that you've gotten. You talked about sacrifice. We're talking financial, physical, yes. emotional. Sometimes you even sacrifice your sleep. Yep. But you're sitting here and you're willing to share with other people because you understand that you've got the more than a growth mindset that people can benefit from. Yep. So, so from me to you, I say first, um, congratulations for being nominated for Investor of Thank the Year. Thank you very much. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that you, you bring it home tomorrow. Um, so. When this episode airs, obviously, you, it would have passed, yes. right? Um, but I, I want to tell you right here on this platform that you're doing well. And I appreciate you taking time uh, to come and sit down with me. Thank you very much for having me, Witness. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, brother. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't written anything down since you started watching this episode, Backtrack, restart it, sit down, take a pen and paper and jot down as many nuggets as you can. Go out there, start implementing. Action. Action. None of this matters unless we take action. Right. Right. We can talk all day, but if the action is not there, it's not going to benefit anyone. Uh, and also take action by clicking on that subscribe button, clicking on that notifications bell so that you don't miss any of our fantastic upcoming videos now from myself and my team broadcasting from the QGI Consulting Studios in Johannesburg, South Africa. It's more than just money. See you in the next episode. Ciao, ciao.